I have a number of things right off the top I'm going to tell you about that uh, that we're doing today, and then we'll get into the meat of the show. First of all, coming up in just a short while, we'll be joined by Steve Millington, the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, going to be talking some gas taxes with him, some competing proposals to fund transportation issues at the state capitol. Some could be a little less onerous on your pocketbook, but those may not be the ones that are adopted by state legislators. Steve will have some thoughts about that issue, along with a couple of other things that may be going on. Also, we're going to be talking to uh, to a woman who's coming by in a few minutes about an opportunity for you, if you're a business person, to try and find a large customer base that you may not have been aware is available to you. In fact, there's going to be a discussion on this in a couple of days at a meeting in town. She'll give you all the details on how you could attend that session, and you could learn a little bit more about picking up some extra cash when it comes to advertising to some groups that you may have traditionally overlooked. And the third thing I wanted to bring up, at least in the early part of the show, if you were listening to what we call the top story tease just before 8 o'clock news, you heard me mention concealed carry. You recall as well that there was a discussion a few weeks ago about allowing Idaho, I think there are three other states that currently do this, they have concealed carry laws that do not require you to have a permit. And we've made the argument many times on this program The Constitution doesn't say anything about having a note from your mommy. There's no mention in the Second Amendment of a permit. These are things that have been added on by people over the years in various governments, and we've grown accustomed to it, and now we believe that that is constitutional. Well, you could find a lot of people out there who are very much strict adherents to that original document who would tell you otherwise. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in Idaho this year. A committee looked it over last week and just pushed it off to the side. But I've been looking at some of the other AP copy, that is the Associated Press wire traffic that comes down the line. Idaho House panel introduces gun rewrite proposal. It says Idaho lawmakers are once again seeking to remove a special exemption that allows elected officials to carry concealed guns without a permit. Doesn't say you. It says elected officials could carry guns without a permit. Because what? They're special? Is is that what we're getting at? Well, Bill, you understand it's being very dangerous uh, walking around as a state legislator. Uh, I get all my health benefits paid for, and my family does as well. And I'm going to have a wonderful retirement benefit that the rest of you won't have. And that's because I serve the public. I'm looking out for you. And by the way, if someone doesn't like me, I need the opportunity to defend myself. Uh, And maybe if you're in the neighborhood, I'll defend you too, but you can't defend yourself. This is what we're dealing with right now with some of these decisions coming out of the state legislature. The writer says the bill would also address where Idahoans can carry weapons without a permit outside city limits. Currently, it's allowed only while fishing, hunting, or participating in another outdoor activity. The measure was introduced after top House and Senate Republicans announced last week that the so-called constitutional carry bill is dead. So, once more, why do legislators get to bypass that while the rest of us still have to have a permit? Are they smarter than the rest of us? Are they better looking than the rest of us? Are they a better sort of human being than the rest of us? Are we a subhuman caste so we can't be trusted? How does this work? When they came around looking for your votes, they all said great things about you and said that they would be working for you and that that was their mission in life was just to serve. But here you go again. They are going to carve out a special little corner for themselves, and they're going to give themselves something that the rest of you don't get. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story. You can reach our program today by dialing us up at 736-0300, or you could send me an email at bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. That last name is spelled C-O-L-L-E-Y, bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. 8.11 8.11 now on our show, 33 at our studios, looking for temperatures this week, very moderate. By Sunday, we could be Saturday and Sunday well into the 70-degree range, so we could be outside enjoying some really mild, mild weather, but you won't be able to defend yourself, unless, of course, you have a note from your mother. But your state legislators will be able to, so remember that. And then I found this today as well. In a related story, as I like to say when you're watching a TV newscast, The National Rifle Association is warning that the president's administration, that means a national story when you hear president and the like, is planning to ban, of course, one type of AR-15 ammo 
And they say that is just at the National Rifle Association. They say that is just the first step in taking away all hunting rounds, a backdoor bid to impose national gun control. This comes from the Washington Examiner. And a writer by the name of Paul Bedard is getting it from a fellow he interviewed. You may know the fellow's name, Wayne LaPierre. He is with the National Rifle Association. Now, the NRA usually has a president who's sort of a figurehead. It's been Charlton Heston in the past. Uh, at one time, it was actually my friend John Sigler. Uh, John had been a former police officer, then a lawyer, and worked as a, a president of the NRA. But LaPierre does all of the heavy lifting in the organization. And he's, he's, he's saying if we, we allow this to happen, and the government comes in by fiat, and the president says you cannot own certain ammunition, he bypasses Congress altogether, this is just the start, that he'll start looking at other ways to disarm the American public. And he mentions there are any number of rounds. Now, the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, actually it's got a much bigger name today because they throw in explosives in there too. We wouldn't want people to have a couple of sparklers on the 4th of July. Well, they say it's to prevent something happening with a big fertilizer bomb, etc., 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 so that's why we need to spy on Americans and the like. But the odds of that happening usually are slim and none. So the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the B-A-T-F-E, federal acronyms, I, it's at some point, <laughs> there's a couple of dirty words you could say about that, but this is a family radio program. We'll leave it at that. These people have said that perhaps they cannot, by law, ban that particular ammo for the AR-15. But they're not going to stop there. They're going to look for any potential back door, and they're going to get together with whatever voodoo wizards they have working on the legal team at the White House to figure out a way to make it stick, or at least to prolong it in courts. And by the time you finally get it settled, they won't even be manufacturing the AR-15 anymore because no one will be buying it because they don't have the ammo. We have a caller with us, 814. Bill Colley with you on Top Story, and you're up next on News Radio 1310 KLIX. Hey, good morning, Bill. Hey, uh, you know, this, these libtards, they don't even know what a gun is to begin with. And, you know, an AR-15 they have proven has not been used to kill a police officer, and they are lying about that. Right. In fact, the, uh, the, the Fraternal Order of Police has said there's no record of that ever happening. You know, you can take a 308. And go, I'm sorry, I should, probably shouldn't be saying this, but you can take a 308. Any rifle will go through that vest. So yeah. Go, so, so to call this an assault weapon, it's, which it's not, call it a military-style rifle, which it's not, <laughs> I'm sick of these libtards. Well, I'll tell you, when it comes to a definition like assault weapon, if I walk up to someone and I take a fist and I slam it right into their chin, my fist is then an assault weapon. Right, right. And, and and so to to even use that phrase, uh, it's a very narrow definition they're trying to apply to uh, to well. If 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 you're a liberal media person who has no idea what you're talking about, it sounds cool and it sounds sexy, I guess, to say it. And that way you can convey that these are uh, these are these are firearms that are being used to uh, just shoot things up for fun or shoot up other people, and in and we're leaving dead people around the countryside in the bucket loads. Simply yeah. not happening. Yeah, I just, I just love how smart they think they are. Well, I thank you much for the call. I <laughs> How smart they are. Look, they go around, they create email addresses uh, for themselves, bypassing uh, federal regulations, and then they turn around and say, here's 55,000 printed copies. Have fun sorting through all of them. <laughs> this is, she's speaking about this later today, if you didn't know who I was talking about. So, yes, for people who are supposedly the brightest people who walk into any room, uh, sometimes they are two beers short of a six-pack. You know, the not the sharpest tool in the shed. The elevator doesn't go to the top floor. You pick one. It's 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 what we're talking about with a great many of these people. But they have been able, because there is a large percentage of the population that doesn't understand that term assault weapon, they have been able to convince a lot of people to frighten a lot of people out there, which is the job of the establishment media. And they frighten people by passing along the warnings and the concerns of their master-in-chief, I mean the President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama, who's under some criticism too right now because he has tried to rule by fiat on a number of issues. Uh, that would be with, uh, with amnesty for illegal aliens. That would be for his efforts to sign a treaty with the Iranians and let, let them build a nuclear bomb, and he would be bypassing Congress. 
it was always my understanding that any treaty had to uh, had to finally uh, get Senate approval before it became effective. Uh, he believes simply he's going to bypass the Senate. Meanwhile, a handful of senators write a letter to the Iranians and point out the problem with that and say, hey, in a couple of years, his successor may not go along with this. And then they're accused of interfering with what he's doing. You figure that one out. 17 minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX, as well as online. You can hear us anywhere around the world, newsradio1310.com. And you're up next. What's on your mind? Hey, Bill. Uh, I was just going to say, it really isn't how smart they are or anything like that. It's how much lawless backing that they have. You know, with all the, with the way Obama is, they don't have to be smart. Just anything they want, you know. It's, it's anything that they want, that they want to target and focus. They have all the backing and all the media backing that they could ever have. And I think you're spot on. They just draw it up as they go along as well. Thanks for the call, too. What you have is, and they have a a passive media in support of them. I've seen this happen before. Eugene Marvin the Martian Robinson, who's a nationally syndicated newspaper columnist based at the Washington Post, but also a regular on Morning Joe over at MSDNC, he has said in the past that the president should just go ahead and make these decisions on his own, like a king, like an emperor. Well, you know, he, he wants to ensure that the, uh, the the brother succeeds, I guess. But he's made these arguments over and over and over again publicly, and he doesn't see anything wrong with this. And that's the thing. They get up in the morning, and it's, gee, it, I feel bad when somebody's feelings are hurt. Therefore, we should have laws against people's feelings getting hurt. Then they get up the next day. Gee, it's awfully hot today. I think we should have laws designed so we can stop people from using oil and coal and wood, and then we can have it cooler out again. And then the next day they get up, gee, I have a queasy feeling about, and then they just make another decision. This is how they govern. There's no long-term plan. There's no center core. Well, if it is, it's, it's very anti-capitalist. I saw something today in a newspaper out of Boise. where, And if we get a chance, I'll talk about this coming up in the, in the program a bit later. A newspaper out of Boise where, so frustrating sometimes to see these things or read these things. They're complaining about the fact that in order to keep state parks open, that the state may be using some corporate money, corporate sponsorships. And as I was reading it, I thought the writer, you could just say he he, he simply doesn't like capitalists. If there's a corporate entity involved with it, he's going to hate it. It's a knee-jerk reaction. They don't sit down and say, well, wait a minute, what are the actual merits of all of this? It's just their own personal prejudices getting in the way of a decision like that. And again, when they believe they're the smartest people around, everyone else is supposed to listen or be forced to listen, or be forced to comply, this is the result of what you get. Have some guests coming up before we wrap up this hour. Steve Millington will be along about 8.30 this morning, and we're also going to be talking about an advertising opportunity for you business people that you may have overlooked, and an opportunity to make a few extra dollars. Coin is a really good thing, isn't it? You can tell I'm a capitalist. It's 33. Bill Colley with you. It's 8.20. I have a guest joining us in the studio, and uh, there's an event coming up on Thursday that she's going to be talking a little bit about. And if you're in in business anywhere in the Magic Valley, uh, it might be worthwhile to actually attend this event. Uh, Her goal is to tell you how you can get involved and actually do that. Shaleen, there we go. I got it. See, I told you I'd get it. Hi, Bill. Gilliland is joining us in studio. And that's just because I'm a stutterer from way back. I knew the name. Um, It just sometimes you get to certain letters. Have you ever had that happen and you just... It's like you yeah, get stuck. Yeah, uh, my name is all I's and L's. Just put them together in whatever random order. I'm good. John Stossel says that when he did his very first television live report, he got hung up on a word, and he said it, would, it was like rat-a-tat-tat-tat about 10 times before he got through it. It's amazing that we picked this as a career when you... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're doing great, Bill. I'm glad to be here. Uh, well, I want to thank you for coming by. It's 825, 32, our temperature... Uh, looking for a high today, probably well into the 50s before we wrap things up uh, this evening. And to, just to let you know, you're listening to Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX. You're here today because there's an event coming up. It's going to discuss how people can, as an advertiser or a business person, reach out to the growing Latino community in the area. 
Absolutely. The Hispanic Advertising Workshop. So I'm here representing the Magic Valley Advertising Federation. We are an organization that is a local branch of the national uh, organization, which is the American Advertising Federation. We've been a branch here in the Magic Valley for over 10 years now and growing um, as we get more involved with people who represent both the media side of advertising and the buyer side of advertising, which is where I've spent my years um, as marketing director of the mall and as a consultant in, in advertising and marketing. And so this Thursday is a workshop that we've actually been working on for about a year and a half to put together. And that is the Hispanic Advertising Workshop. We're actually bringing a woman from an advertising agency in Texas, where she is in the heart of knowing how to advertise to people of Hispanic background. And with that growing demographic here in our market, this is definitely something that we knew was on the horizon to be able to speak their language. So, so to say, without speaking, you know, knowing Spanish, knowing how to send a message from whatever, whatever product or, or service you're offering out and have it resonate with them. It, it's it's more than just the language because I, from what I can see, a lot of people from the Hispanic backgrounds, uh, they're reading English language newspapers already. They're listening to English language radio. They're watching local TV. They may still obviously listen to some right. Spanish radio and the like, but if, if you just target those areas, you're still going to miss a lot of. Uh, a, a lot, a lot of the. It, it's more of a cultural approach, isn't it? It, it really is, and understanding um, their demographics, what culture they bring with them, and what what really is important to them, and their advertising, um, what works with them, is really different than what we expect is is the a certain style. Um, they they re resonate with something else. So what I want you to know is that um, the workshop is on Thursday. And usually we just have a monthly luncheon, but once a year we bring in a great speaker. We have a, a full day thing. This uh, starts with registration at 8 o'clock. The event starts at 8.30. And we're going to uh, put you through a series of courses until uh, lunch and then dismiss at 1 o'clock. And so um, sh the Mary Hunt of Hunt Advertising is actually going to cover a demographic overview and then how to reach them by medium and then the creative, how to speak to your audience. So, And not only that, we will have the local options for advertising there represented so that you know what's available in our market that is really reaching out to the Hispanic background. So if you want to get a ticket, it's $40 to come to the workshop, which includes lunch, great deal. Um, we'd rather you spent that $40 to take your day locally than get on a plane, fly somewhere, spend two days at a conference. <laughs> That's really what we're trying to offer here. And so you can call Caitlin Lancaster. She's our president at 308-1889. Again, that's 308 308- one eight eight nine, and uh, find out how to get registered for that. We do need to know if you're coming. We don't need payment in advance, but we do need to make sure we've got lunch for you. This is going to be held at the Canyon Crest Dining and Event Center. Ooh. Yes, so we'll <laughs> we'll have a great lunch. We'll have a great environment to really collaborate together. We'll have some time to visit, to do some creative together, but as well, just really, it's going to be brain candy for the day. And I was going to say, uh, once you walk out of there, you can take that knowledge back to your entire staff. You so you don't have to have everyone there. One person can be the conduit. Absolutely. And that investment of $40 and, and that time away from work will make you better in your job because one in $5 in this market comes from some Hispanic background. 20% of our market, if you reach as far as, you know, including your, your Elko market, if that should be your, you know, your client and all the way to the Rupert Burley area and such, um, including that, that, that is a very viable reason to attend. And I was going to say, you, you, you're dealing with a population that is growing, but in many cases, this living in the Western part of the country is different than people like me who lived in the Eastern part of the country. Some of these people have already been here three, 400 years. Uh, mm. But again, that there's still sometimes a cultural divide that you'd like to address. There, there are uh, celebrations. There are intricacies within their culture that that it would be great for us to understand and be able to communicate better with. I was going to say they know how to cook. Better <laughs> than I am. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming by today. No problem. Let me leave you that phone number again. Call Caitlin Lancaster at 308-1889. Uh, get your reservation in for that event.
All right, super. Steve Millington coming up next in just a few minutes on KLIX. This is Top Story. It's 32 at our studios at 830. Before we get to our next guest, I just want to mention a quick note. I've been telling people for the last several weeks, if you're looking to make a few extra dollars, you can do that simply by, uh, in fact, a lot of people find this as a great schedule, a great way f for a second income uh, to, uh, to help out with the family. But you can contact Western States Bus Services, where they're training school bus drivers, hiring part-time drivers right now, split shifts five days per week, summers off, and scheduled no school days. The pay is $10.75 an hour, and they will train you. Apply today by contacting 733-8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. Also wanted to remind you, tomorrow morning, doctors should be in. Uh, we're going to be joining by our friends tomorrow morning at Trip Family Medicine. That's on Fillmore Street in Twin Falls. And we're going to be talking medical issues between 8.30 and 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And gosh, we have a lot to talk about. Everything, I guess, from measles to vaccines to uh, just other general health issues. Those of us who are getting a little bit older know that sometimes those health issues start to cascade. And we're not talking about a mountain range. Uh, but they will be joining us tomorrow morning between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. If you have some calls... For the doctor or the uh, physician's assistant or nurse or whoever is in studio with us tomorrow morning, feel free to give us a shout. Speaking of uh, calls, I think he's uh, busy uh, doing some plumbing uh, work at home today. But Steve Millington is the chairman of the Twin Falls uh, County Republican Party. He's joining us by telephone today uh, versus his usual uh, seat here in the studio. It actually has his name on it. He's been here so often. But first of all, welcome back. Hey there. Good morning. How are you? I'm I'm doing fine. Hey, th we we swapped a couple of emails uh, earlier this morning, and one thing yep, that I wanted to what, what's that? Yeah, we sure did. Yes, yes. Well, what, you know, at what? least we were kinder than the Secretary of State. I mean, the former Secretary of State. Uh, uh, we didn't hide anything in those. Um, oh, but <laughs> uh, right off the top, there is a legislator who's proposing, or a couple of them in Boise, uh, a, a short-term transportation bill. But in their proposal, they're only talking about a five percent increase or five cent increase in the gasoline tax, which is smaller than the one that had been floated. You told me about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the leadership, yeah, that's right. though. The, the leadership, well, the, though. No, the, well, the the GOP leadership is having a difficult time getting their arms around how much funding do we uh, uh, allow or create for transportation. And, and uh, the, the range has started out at 10, and then there was a proposal that was proposed 10 cents a gallon. They proposed one that said 8 cents a gallon on gas and 12 cents on diesel. Now they're down to 5 cents a gallon on gas, and I'm assuming that the diesel is the same range or thereabouts. The, the, the problem that they have with this is that we have such a mindset against raising taxes for anything that nobody can really get their arms around how can we generate more money for transportation expenses and at the same time not increase any taxes. And, and the two are kind of in contradiction to one another, you know? I was going to say it, fixing roads is not something you can do on the cheap. Well, and that's part of the problem, Bill. Too many people think that they, they drive down the road and it's, it looks pretty good and, it, you know, it doesn't have too many potholes and bumps in it, and so they think maybe this is okay. There is study after study that indicates that if you spend $1 on road maintenance today, you save somewhere between 8 and $12 for major reconstruction in the future. And so the transportation guys are saving, saying, or they're begging, give us the $250 million so that we can keep a regularly scheduled maintenance program in place and avoid the uh, ex excessive cost of rebuilding the, the uh, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. And they have a very good point. The difficulty is nobody wants to raise any taxes. And that's a problem. I was going to say, it reminds me of the old Fram oil filter commercial, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. Uh, you know... <laughs> that's that's interesting. I had a I I, I w uh, was doing some uh, uh, shopping yesterday, and and one of the guys uh, used that exact same phrase. You, this is this Fram oil filter. Pay me now or pay me later. And I just kind of laughed. And then and then when you brought the same thing up again, I thought you know we need to kind of think about that a little bit. It is hard 
to say, okay, we're going to add 10 cents a gallon. Now, around the Magic Valley area, we've seen gas prices go up probably 30 cents a gallon in the last uh, two weeks, three weeks. Yeah. Well, you know, we could have we could have placed a, 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 a 10 cent a gallon uh, tax in the middle of that, and uh, yeah, none of us would really like it, but we could have buried the impact of the tax in the escalation of retail pricing, and then most people would forget all about it. But we've missed that. We missed that hurdle. We should we should point out too that uh, even a temporary plan would be better than no plan at all. But I think what the leadership is saying, despite the the proposal of temporary, is we've got to get something done. And finally, you know, decided to bite the bullet and take whatever hit they will have to take from the voting public. Um, you know that the. the the, the last time I, I visited with the uh, uh, speaker, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Scott Bedke, um, his plan is to adjourn the session by the 27th of March. And I think that's two weeks from Friday. That doesn't give them very much time to work out the process for transportation. In addition to which, we still have the big, um, the elephant in the room, so to speak, is the education budget. Well, hold They're on to that thought. Hold on to that thought. Okay. We have a break coming up. Uh, Steve Millington is going to stay on the line with us, joining us this morning by telephone. He's the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. It's 32 at our studios. It's 840 on Top Story with Bill Colley. More with Steve coming up. During the, uh, during the, the break where you were hearing from uh, some of our fine sponsors, they make this program possible, I should point out, and I'd like you to support them as much as you can, and that'll keep us in business. It's 844-32 at our studios, News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com online means you can hear us anywhere around the country. Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning, along with Steve Millington. He is the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, joining us by telephone this morning. And Steve, we were talking during the uh, during the commercial break about how this is such a unique legislative session in that you have two really big, not one, but two really big spending issues competing for sometimes too few dollars. That's exactly right. And and the, the, the other, uh, we mentioned the transportation in the first part of the program. The other huge elephant in the room is the education uh, budget. And, and uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, when we talk about education, if we take not only uh, K to K through 12, but the higher education budget as well, the, the two of them combined approaches about 62 or 63 percent of the total uh, Idaho general fund budget. So that's a huge amount of money that we're going to talk about spending. The other thing that impacts education this year, perhaps more poignantly than anything in the past, is we're trying to put together a package of teacher compensation, salaries. And, and uh, there's all kinds of plans out there. We, the, the, the governor's 20-point program said we need to raise the minimum uh, starting wage to $40,000 a year over a five-year period. And so we have to begin uh, moving up that pay scale. That, that currently it's at 31750 So they want to move it, start moving that up closer to 40. And, and as you do that, you got to make sure that you've got the funds uh, allocated to uh, pay those teachers. Because once you commit to a teacher pay, if you don't have the funds, then the other uh, uh, functions, auxiliaries associated with education, are going to get shortchanged, and you have to figure out what are we going to cut so that we keep the teacher salary intact. And that's a big, big step. And, and it's going to be a, not an easy bridge to cross. And frankly, many of the people in the legislature, this is where we're getting the real conflict of, of ideologies they, they say to themselves, wait a minute, we've got, to, we've got to take care of education out of the general fund. But one of the proposals on this transportation uh, issue is that we will take money from general fund and, and uh, assign it to the transportation department over a period of two or three years and reduce the gas tax increase back down to its current levels. And, and the, the, the issue with that is, Man alive, if we start down this education road, we better make sure that we have got the proper funds allocated to take care of the education uh, funding before we start, well, I call it robbing the general fund. That's probably a bad, poor choice of words. 
but before we start robbing the general fund to take care of transportation, because transportation has always been its kind of its own self entity. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the, the uh, uh, budgetary proposals, uh, the, the three point two or three point three billion dollars has no money for transportation. That's all accounted for outside of the general fund in its own separate Department of Transportation funding. And, and uh, gas taxes go in there and registrations and things like that, and that pays for our uh, uh, road construction and maintenance. So there's, they're, they're trying to, they're drawing lines here uh, that are crossing lines that may be hard to undo in future years, and that's where you get into problems. Our guest is Steve Millington. He's the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. Coming up on 848-32 at our studios, you're listening to Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com with Bill Colley. Uh, Steve, one thing we could probably say is if, and I was just sitting here thinking, sometimes it seems like there's no way out, but by golly, if the state could get its hands on some of those lands seized years and years and years ago by the federal government and maybe... Yeah. turn around and lease that land or sell that land off to a private enterprise, maybe we could find some of the money we're looking for. Well, there, there's always that. You know, one of the difficulties that Idaho faces is that approximately 60%, and, and I could be wrong on that. It might be just a little higher than that, maybe 64 65% of the total land inside the borders of the state of Idaho is controlled by the federal government. Uh, and, and that creates a real problem because, we number one, we don't get any uh, uh, property tax revenues off of that, whereas the states in the, in the east, uh, we don't even have to go that far. You can just go to Nebraska and Kansas and, and uh, Arkansas and Missouri. Those, people, those places have um, huge property tax bases that we do not have because they don't have all these federal lands. The other thing that's an issue is that the federal government has reduced uh, in, in incremental steps over the past 20 years the amount of uh, usage that we can take from federal lands. They've cut back the mining, the timber. Um, you know, there seems to be a, a, a mindset that says we're not going to do any logging. Uh, we'd rather just let the stuff sit out there and grow and then have forest fires and burn it all down <laughs> than to log it and turn it into a productive resource. And, and most good forestry management people will tell you, manage the forest. And that includes a commercial logging facility. We don't do that. That's a liberal and, policy. And so, let it burn down. Yeah, let it burn down. Uh, yeah, that's uh, just and you know the same thing with the, with the uh, uh, grazing. Uh, cattle is a big part of what we do in Idaho, and we, in order to make that the most beneficial, we need to use or have access to the federal lands to graze livestock. And everybody says, oh, these cattlemen, they just go out there and they destroy and pillage and plunder and they, well they don't that's their livelihood they go they manage it they watch it they out there every day either on horseback or on their uh in their vehicles four wheels they just go out and look and they walk and they look at the territory and they say to themselves man there's no grass here we're gonna have to move the cattle or else they say whoa that rain was really beneficial look at how much grass we got coming back we can rotate the cattle here and here and here and take advantage of it they do not destroy, and, and that's a horrible mindset that got created some years back, and, and uh, we have a tough time reversing that particular thought process. They don't really they want to destroy anything. That's what they do for a living. Why would we destroy it? I, I Stupid know, idea. I know I don't ask you a lot about national topics because, uh, you know, your role is really focused in Idaho and really focused in Twin Falls County, uh, but there's one, one uh, big story coming up today. I just, I've been seeing the headlines crawling across my Fox News monitor here this morning. It's 851 at our studios, 32. Bill Colley with you on Top Story, News Radio 1310 KLIX, as well as News Radio 1310.com. Our guest is Steve Millington. Uh, Hillary Clinton is finally going to have a news conference today and meet with the press. Um, from a standpoint of a Republican official, you've got to look back at these last couple of weeks and think this is a real gift. Well, you know, she has. Uh... Uh, I, I think she's uh, built herself into a, a, a painted herself into a corner or built a box around herself that's going to be real hard to get out of, and and it'll be real interesting to see how she uh, uh, portrays this whole thing in this news conference. 
it's there's an awful lot of uh, uh, smoke, and you know where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, there's an awful lot of smoke around these issues, and it's very apparent that uh, in more than one situation, these emails. Um, she actually sent out notices to people and said, "You can't use your private emails. You got to use the the, the government uh, email services." And what did she do? The exact opposite. She put it all on her own private email. Well, hello. Do we want somebody that is that blatantly disrespectful of, of protocol and procedures to be president of the United States? We've already got one. I mean, yeah, we've got one. We don't need another one. I mean, that, I, I look at that and I say to myself, man, this would just be plumb off. But it will be fascinating to see how the liberal media, the drive-by media, I think is a phrase that uh, one of the Fox people uses all the time, how they couch this thing to protect her so that they can keep the darling girl from being run over. Well, it's going to be interesting to watch. Be, because if I'm a Republican, I want an Elizabeth Warren instead because it's like a repeat of George McGovern, and that means probably a 49-50 state win for a Republican candidate come exactly. next year. That's right. If, if an Elizabeth Warren comes in there, by the time she hits the the, uh, the big uh, national playing stage and, and a, a good, solid Republican gets a few shots at her, um, they, she will wilt in the, in the warm warmth of the sun. And, and that's exactly, as a Republican, what we want to do is to have, uh, let, let's have, you know, in, in, in 2008 and 2012, the Republicans uh, killed each other. There were so many candidates that they just took cheap shots at one another. The Democrats kind of stood back and watched, and 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 we just kind of beat ourselves to death. So let's let's hope that the Democrats get into a situation where they have to uh, beat each other up. I think that would be a good thing. We do. Uh, maybe I'm kind of selfish, but yeah, okay, so I am. Let's let the Democrats beat each other up. We would get the to real, know. The, the real important thing is. Are we talking about character flaws of individuals and, and their lack of uh, uh, integrity and clarity and, and uh, uh, the best interest of the United States of America rather than what's best for me? And that's, I think, one of the key things that we need to be looking at is that does this individual have the best interest of the United States of America uppermost in their mind, or are they just simply... Um, wanting to, to uh, uh, climb their own personal little mountain. I'm, that, reminded, I'm reminded, Steve, of a, 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 a town hall meeting that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West was, was holding, I think when he was still in Congress a few years ago, and the, the Democrats had done, some, done something fairly shady, and it had backfired on them, and somebody in the audience asked him his response. He smiled and started dancing. <laughs> 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 and I yeah, think that and, a lot of people feel that way about Hillary Clinton right now. Yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, you, you can only do these kinds of things so long before the, quote, chickens come home to roost. And, and I think maybe uh, it's time that these things happen. There's just too, man, too, much, too much smoke around these issues. And where there's smoke, there's always some fire. So well, let's get the thing resolved. As you said... Uh, her, uh, her her fellow travelers and allies and media will try and throw her, a, I guess, a, a lifeline, but it's going to be, I think, a little difficult for her to climb out of this one. Uh, I, I would hope that it would be, because it's a real difficult mess. And, and frankly, it, it's, you know, I, I heard or read at one point where that uh, somebody uh, from a foreign country actually hacked into her server and found all this stuff and, and just started passing it around. And I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, you know, what kind of stuff, if somebody from some foreign country can hack into this thing and figure out what's going on, shoot, it's priest. Yeah, that I doesn't was... make you nervous, nothing does. Well, they're very close in her family to the Chinese government. So, uh, look, we've got to wrap up, but next week maybe we can plan on spending a little bit more time together as this legislative yes. session comes to an end. I think maybe that would be a good idea because we're, we're going to get down to some real tough decision-making in the next uh, 10 days. So it will be interesting to see exactly how the uh, state legislature uh, couches all of these issues so that they can get the job done. Yeah, and, and it, it will be crunch time, that's for sure. 
Well, look. What is your will? Enjoy the rest of the day, and uh, we'll talk again in a week or so, if not sooner. Thank you very much, Bill. All have right, a have day. a good day. Steve Ellington joining us this morning. He is, of course, chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, uh, joining us by uh, telephone this morning because he's got some uh, chores to do around the house. Uh, coming up now on 9 o'clock, and in 9 o'clock uh, hour, or 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, what time zone are we in again? Oh, it's that daylight savings time thing. They had an opportunity in this legislative session to address that too, and once again they didn't. It seems to me that would be a slam dunk. Who's in favor of getting rid of daylight savings time? All right, it's unanimous. Done. It would have been a very quick thing to, to take care of in the state legislature. Nobody likes it. Nobody. I mean, I, I don't know of anyone out there who has told me, oh, because of the extra hour of daylight in the evening, I can get so much done and we have so much fun. Never happens. But uh, we're coming up on 9 o'clock. News from the Fox Radio Network. One more hour of Top Story with Bill Colley still ahead. And, of course, following the news at 10 o'clock, Rush Limbaugh will join us right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX, as well as online, where you can hear us anywhere around the world, at NewsRadio1310.com. Still hasn't warmed up much yet this morning. Holding steady at our studios at 32. The, uh, the ACLU has come to the aid of an American football team. Perhaps we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. It's a strange, what do they say, a strange bedfellows? A strange story that is, uh, has been reported in the last couple of days by the publication National Review. National Review Online, that's where I happened to find it yesterday afternoon. Also, Wall Street Journal today says that Democrats who have been surveyed in a recent poll... 86% still back Hillary Clinton to be the next president, which should tell you a little bit about what they're all about. Uh, well, alley cats travel together, I guess. 907, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. 32 right now at our studios. This is News Radio 1310 KLIX. Also, our website, newsradio1310.com. They don't have any morals, apparently. They think that lying and cheating and secrecy is a good thing. And it doesn't bother them in a candidate. They'll complain, of course, and scream and yell about ours if we even sneeze or look cross-eyed. But, you know, in, in this particular case, it's okay. I saw something this morning, and it just got my goat. There are a great many people, these lefties, you know, they're all granola chompers who are hugging trees and chewing on the bark. They just cannot stand the thought of American business coming to the rescue of some of their most beloved institutions. I bring this up. This is a guest commentary today in the Idaho Statesman. From what I understand, that is the leading newspaper in Boise. Yeah, that and a couple of dollars will get you a cup, a cup of coffee. And a writer by the name of Rick Just. It's like Josh Ernest over at the White House. You know, the press spokesman. If you ever were looking for a caricature, Josh Ernest. Well, here you have a guy named Rick Just who is writing in favor of Idaho State Parks. And he says, Idaho Bill needs to preclude corporation names for state parks. I'm just get, giving you a few highlights of this. I took my ye little yellow highlighter out this morning, in fact. He writes, some fear this will lead to over-commercialization in state parks and even the naming of state parks after corporations. We just spent half an hour talking with Steve Millington about the fact that this state has so little ways to, or few ways to generate revenue because the federal government sits atop two-thirds of the land, and then if the state has park land, that land isn't being taxed either because, well, it's state park land. It's not like you've got people out there who are living in great big homes who are paying property taxes. The writer goes on to say, why do they want to do this in the first place? There has been a suggestion, and this has been done in a great many other states. You have corporate sponsors for parks. They are willing to come in and give you money I saw this when I lived in Broome County, New York. I was running a TV station in Binghamton, New York, in Broome County. And Broome County, the acronym being BC, was also the home county to the cartoonist Johnny Hart. Johnny Hart, one of his cartoons happened to be BC. So characters from his comic strips were all over the parks. You'd come, there'd be a cartoon dinosaur. Uh, you'd see uh, the, the BC Open, which was the big golf tournament there that was played every year. The logo of it was the cartoon character BC swinging a golf club. 
prehistoric one, but swinging a golf club. So this fellow is writing, he says he's friends of the state parks, he belongs to that organization, but he's angered because he says, someday, someday, <sighs> you can hear him getting all angry about this, a state park may be named after a company. And he says, you know, would you see Taco Bell State Park or something like it? Well, if it keeps the park open, why not? <laughs> it's not like they're going to have a restaurant out in the middle of it. Hey, come look at the bears and hey, have a have a taco too while you're at it. But don't feed them. Uh, if you feed them, they may take your arm too. We have a caller with us. Ten minutes after nine o'clock on Top Story with Bill Colley. You're up next on News Radio 1310 KLIX. Hey, Bill. I was just uh, going to go back a little on that where you were talking about Elizabeth Warren to Steve. You know, uh, in any other time, I would say that she would not be viable at all. But, you know, you take it. By the time this man gets all the illegals all registered to vote, there could be 25 million of them here by his two years. I tell you, it, it, it could happen. And it's scary. Well, when it, if and when she ever gets to the White House, um, I, I fear for the future. Well, I already fear for the future of our country. That is a scary, scary possibility that you bring up. Thank you for the call. And you're next. You're up on the air, in fact, on NewsRadio1310.com and NewsRadio1310KLIX. Good morning. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Your connection sounds a little bit better. In the beginning, it was a little a little quiet, but we're, we seem to be on the same uh, same vein now. Okay. Uh, on state lands in Idaho, let the people that use them pay for them. And this this will this will put a lot of money into the coffers. Uh, grazing on state lands is 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 given away basically. And I am a animal livestock grower, and I have to compete my market on private grazing against people who I'm going to say rape and pillage state lands. <laughs> Not that they when they pay for it, they pay you know two bucks an animal unit per month. Where in the private industry you would pay uh, twenty dollars an animal unit. Let them pay their fee or get out if they can't compete. Let somebody else that wants to do it. And uh, that, that's just part of what would alleviate part of the problems of the state financing. Get your just money's worth from the property. Well, thank you. I thank you for the call. And, and when it comes to state park use, though. Here's the question. How much would that raise that park admission fee? If you start getting up into $70, $80, $100, no one's going to come to the parks, and it defeats the purpose. I, mean, I know the conservationists say, well, we, we don't want people there. We want just the squirrels and the, the muskrats and the bear, and, and, and so we don't really want people there. But the whole idea of a state park was so you could go and enjoy it, a little recreation, and get out about once in a while. And if we, we put that price up there to some ridiculous figure like that, then no one's going to show up. Of course, then I guess we could turn it into development land, and hey, we could bring in that tax revenue. You're on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX, and what's on your mind? Is that a fax machine? We're being monitored again by the NSA, aren't we? Well, not very often, maybe just a couple hours per day. They don't have to listen to us for Rush Limbaugh. They can hear him just about anywhere. So this fellow writing in the Idaho Statesman says he's concerned about future boards, directors, and legislator, legislatures. When funding again becomes tough, might they be tempted by the offer of millions, and he's talking about dollars, in exchange for the right to name a state park for a corporation? Well, if someone wanted to come in and said, we will make sure that the roads in the park are paved, that the concrete steps that move around the park, you know, certain areas that we have, that those are always in good repair, that the grass is mowed in the open fields. Um, yeah, if they want to pay me a few million dollars and put the name outside, I don't have a problem with that. You know, you, you could use Chobani, for instance, might be a good example. It could be a good local corporate citizen in that sense. You're up next at 915. You're on KLIX. Good morning to you. What's on your mind? Good morning, Bill. This is Pat. And you know, Everybody worries about corporate America, but corporate America is America. That's what's made this, this nation great, 
is the people that go out and, and build up something and make it work. And if they can help us keep our our, our budgets in the in the black all the time by supporting parks or naming highways after them or anything else, I'd say let's get at it. I think that uh, whenever I hear a lefty scream about the Koch brothers, I, I point out that the Koch brothers are employing tens of thousands of Americans and often in jobs that are among the best-paid jobs in their communities. Funny how the lefty doesn't see it that way. Yeah, they, they don't understand. People hire people who have money. If they have no money, they can't hire people. So it, 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 it's a vicious circle, but if people want to have good jobs, they must have companies that are successful so they can offer those jobs. Yeah, and there's only really a handful of people out there that I've ever encountered who really know how to launch a successful business. That's why so few people do it. And if we get in their way and say, well, government will take over, we'll have a collective farm, and we'll you know, force everyone to go out and work it a few weeks every year, and then they can go back and live in their cinder block high-rises. That's been tried in other parts of the world, and it has been an abysmal failure. Well, communism has never worked successfully anywhere it's been tried. And the only thing that's been successful is 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 our way of, of, of doing it. And we've been the light of the world because of the, of, of the businesses and the corporate of the United States. And everybody wishes they had what we have, and they'll never get there by becoming socialists or communists. Yeah, agreed. Thank you much for the call. It used to be said that in the old Soviet Union that people, if they were allowed to have their own private plots, took much better care of their private plots and had better vegetables in a smaller yield than they ever got from the larger collective farms. And you, you wonder why that is. Well, let's say you're out working on the collective farm and the guy next to you, he's leaning on the shovel all day. You're not really, after a while, going to be putting in as much effort either because he's going to be taking an equal share, so you're going to lean on the shovel. But if you have an opportunity to own your own, uh, well, it's not ownership, I guess it wasn't considered quite that in the old Soviet Union, but if someone said you can have your own little plot over here in your backyard, you are going to take very good care of that because you know what the effort is that you're putting in there and, and that you get to use uh, the, you know, the fruits of your labors. The other part of this is there's been some studies done. Uh, that I, In fact, I saw one of them about a year ago. We were using it in a management uh, a seminar, and it said that most people perceive that they are always working harder at their job than the other guy. They may be. I mean, we're not saying they aren't. But the common perception is we tend to believe that we are putting more effort into the job than the guy who is sitting in the next cubicle. That is why things like collective collective farms or other collective types of businesses simply have failed and failed miserably throughout human history. I'd like to take a call right now, but it wouldn't be fair to the caller because we have some fine sponsors coming along in just a moment. And uh, they're going to be telling us about some of their fine products that keep us on the air here at News Radio 1310 KLIX. I'd also like to mention one of those fine sponsors, Western States Bus Services. Hiring part time bus drivers right now, split shifts five days per week, summers off and scheduled, no school days. Pay is $10.75 per hour. You could apply today by contacting 733 8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. And again, we have some other fine sponsors coming up with some messages in just a moment. Also, if I get an opportunity, I do want to talk about this this morning, perhaps. Uh, the American Thinker had a piece yesterday. The guy who helped develop Common Core says he did it because he's, he's, he's guilt-ridden. He's a white man. And because he's a white man, he's been more privileged than everyone else. So he developed Common Core to take away that privilege from people like him. Well, he probably got a lot of money for it, but he, he thinks the rest of you shouldn't. So he's looking out for you. He's going to make sure that you don't get privilege if you're whitey. And we'll talk about that if we get an opportunity. Also, well, not whitey, but Redskins. The Washington Redskins have found a very unusual ally in the battle to keep the team name. More on that coming up. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310. KLIX, NewsRadio1310.com online, anywhere around the world. 33 at our studios, it's 920. Here's one uh, you might want to chew on this morning. A Canadian fellow who'd been living in New York City. 
you may have heard this already uh, on the news earlier today with Benito. Uh, he would have mentioned it during uh, during uh, AM Idaho. So this fellow was here to uh, to jump off the base. Jumping is not apparently illegal, so at least not in this part of the world. He decided to take a nosedive off a bridge, and his chute didn't open. That's a long fall to a rocky uh, death, and uh, so he didn't make it yesterday. Now. You're going to have, I'm sure, after something like this occurs, people saying, we need to put a stop to it because it is dangerous, so therefore we have to regulate it. And being in government, I'm the smartest guy in the room, so I'm going to be the guy to regulate. But since since it's not every day a chute fails to open, and there have been people who've been jumping off the bridge successfully over on the north end of town, successfully now for a long, long time, Uh, Should one accident preclude everyone else from doing it? Because it's clearly, it's a tourist activity. And people come here for that activity, and then they have to stay in a local hotel. They have to eat in local restaurants, buy gas at a local gas station. So, therefore, yes, it can be dangerous, but just driving here is probably dangerous as well. In fact, uh, one of our guests will be along tomorrow from uh, Trip Family Medicine was telling me, a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know what the most dangerous street in all of Idaho is? It's Blue Legs Boulevard. So just driving out there to get to the bridge, to go jump off the bridge, you're taking your life perhaps into your own hands anyway. But I saw that story, and my first thought was, you will hear cries from people saying, we've got to bring this to an end. We can't have this any longer. Well, look, anybody jumping off a bridge that high knows there is some danger inherent in it. And if, if you're an adult and you can make your decisions about what you want to wear, uh, you know, what type of clothes you're going to wear, what kind of car you want to drive and what you want for breakfast, then I guess you can, you know, make your own judgments about dangerous activities. Because there are a lot of other dangerous activities people engage in. And this one just happened to go, unfortunately, haywire yesterday. Also yesterday, just before I got off the air, somebody emailed me this, and I got to mention it for about 15 seconds, and we didn't get any more time with it. It's 926, I should point out, 34 at our studios. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX, as well as around the world online at NewsRadio1310.com. The American Thinker, here's the headline. Teacher admits he wrote Common Core to end white privilege. That's why Jeb Bush uh, wants it too, right? Because Jeb wants to end white privilege by opening the borders. A professor at Granite State College and chair of the history department at the Dairyfield School in Manchester, New Hampshire, admitted to writing the Common Core State Standards for an English language arts in order to end white privilege. <laughs> Again, because all of you, you whiteys out there know that if you know you go outside your house and you shoot one of your neighbors dead, the cops just come by and give you a wink. You also know that if you're driving at 105 down the highway and you get pulled over and the trooper sees that you are indeed white, that you also get away with that too. Uh, you also understand that if you don't send in your mortgage payment for a couple of years uh, because you're white, they allow you to stay in the house for good, don't they? Yeah, see, so you've got all of these advantages that nobody else gets. So therefore, we have to adjust that. We have to give everything else to everybody, everyone else for free and take things away from you from now on until the end of history. According to the response heard on the video, this fellow's name is Dr. David. He must have been in the last night, uh, last of the uh, the end of the line when they were giving out names. Dr. David Pook, P-O-O-K, shocked the audience at an event at New Hampshire Institute of Politics when he made the following statement, and here it is. Quote, The reason why I helped write the standards and the reason why I'm here today is that as a white male in society, I am given a lot of privilege that I didn't earn. (laughs) Unquote. Well, he didn't really laugh like that. That's not in here. But I assume that he may have in that situation because he probably felt he was being very profound. So he's ending white privilege, but apparently not for himself. Because my guess is he was paid handsomely for his efforts. So he's only looking to end white privilege for other white men, uh, just not for himself. Dr. Pook went on to say to all kids, or say all kids, deserve an equal opportunity to learn how to read. Okay. 
and somebody is stopping them from that? <laughs> hey, he's got a book over there. Take that away from him. <laughs> Give him the video game instead. Have you ever heard a parent say that? It doesn't, doesn't ring a bell with me and my family. Of course, video games came along. I was already in high school, and it just never really caught on with my generation. The writer goes on to say, uh, according to Campus Reform, the Dairyfield School, where Pook works, considers the Common Core standards inferior, and they do not use Common Core standards, not to mention that the school has a student body that is 91% white. In addition, Campus Reform notes that the standards have been especially hard on black and Hispanic students who have seen their test scores plummet since the introduction of Common Core. Isn't that where they do rounding up? Or they bring in the government and the affirmative action people say, well, you only got a 58 and Whitey over here got an 87. So being that you're a minority and you didn't do very well, we'll give you another 20 points. Oh, and you'll get the job over him too. That will be fair in liberal land. 930, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. Speaking of race, the Washington Redskins have some new friends on the left of all places. That story coming up. I don't like to make a lot of assumptions, but I'm going to assume that there are a few football fans in this radio audience. Now, I know that you don't have a, an NFL team within, well, regionally, I'm obviously, but if you actually wanted to go to the game, you'd either have a long drive or you'd have to take a plane. And the two teams in Northern California, Washington State and, and Colorado, uh, and no one else is really very close geographically. On the other hand, college football is really big here because you've got one of the top programs in the country. Understood. But football fans are football fans. I Yes, some people like college a bit more, and some people favor the NFL a bit more than college. And When I was a young guy, I could not. I used to sit at home. When I wasn't playing the game, I was watching the NFL or college and any level of college, or I was watching the CFL, which we could get on TV with the funny field and uh, the funny offenses and, you know, no defense. And I would go watch uh, high school games, and I would go watch Pop Warner games. It's called Pop Warner in some parts of the country. I, it was called Midget where I grew up, and we had teams in two counties, one called Allegheny and one called Cattaraugus. So our league was known as the Alley Cat Football League. Yes, we were a bit like the Clintons. Um, you could have called it the uh, Clinton Football League because uh, Alley Cat, with his morals, pretty much are the same. Had to get that commentary in there just briefly. 935, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. 35 at our studios. This is News Radio 1310, KLIX, as well as News Radio 1310.com, which means online you can hear us anywhere all over the world. Till of course, the president completes the destruction of the Internet. National Review yesterday. ACLU begrudgingly comes... To the Redskins' defense. Now, growing up as a kid, I had a couple of favorite football teams. Uh, my favorite was the Buffalo Bills, which is very painful. But, well, you know, it's a, a suffering exists in this world, and it helps prepare us for the afterlife. So, therefore, I've had my share of it. And my second favorite team, because they played in a different conference, I didn't have to worry too much about them, happened to be the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, between these two ball clubs, they've gone to eight Super Bowls. Did you know that combined? They haven't won any of them, but they've gone to eight combined. So uh, I, they were my two favorite football teams. But even people I knew, my dad liked Buffalo and Cleveland. They were not in the same division, but they were in the same conference. So people have sometimes a secondary favorite or a third favorite. When it came to football, I had the two favorites, but I also had some teams that I liked as long as they weren't playing my team. And those would have been the Kansas City Chiefs as well as the Washington Redskins. When I was a little boy, I was in Washington visiting for the very first time. And I had an opportunity to buy a souvenir. And I could have bought anything to do with government. But instead, I bought myself a license plate, a Washington Redskins license plate. I still have that 40-some years later in a box somewhere. And it's pristine. It looks like I bought it yesterday. It is a beautiful thing. I wasn't going to put it on a car when I got old enough to drive and have it rust away, that's for sure. But I, I've always thought that this notion that the Washington Redskins name, there was a fellow talking on TV. I saw this a few months ago, and he was saying, well, the, the name Redskins was never never really a, a, a negative word or a racial slur until the middle half of the 20th century. 
Well, wait a minute. The team had the name before that, you're telling me. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, yeah, of course. Then why is it a racial slur today? Well, because a group of we liberals decided it was. So you're telling me that nobody else ever thought it was a naughty word, and then you guys all decided at some point it was going to be a naughty word. Why did you do that? Well, because they're, they're, they're football players, and when we were in high school, they used to push us into lockers, and <laughs> we're going to get back at them now. <laughs> Uh, why would you? You're making up a racial slur. It was not a racial slur. The team is named after because it was founded in Boston, Massachusetts, before it moved to Washington. The Boston Tea Party. Boston already had a baseball team named the, named the Braves, so they called them the Boston Redskins, and the name stuck. And when they moved to Washington, they took it with them way back in 1937, which is before it was apparently a racial slur. Now it has been invented as one by the American left. Now, the Obama White House stepped in and tried to take away, I guess, the uh, the copyright. So now anyone could walk around and slap Washington Redskins on a shirt, sell it, and make money. But the ACLU has stepped in and said that they are going to support the Redskins because the American Civil Liberties Union, sometimes known as the Anti-Christian Licentious Union, has said that government is wrong to bully anyone, even if you don't like the word, to bully anyone and take away a legal copyright in this situation. Even though the guys at the ACLU did say that they didn't like the name. But they they will support the team in the use of the name. Which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the other part of this I could never quite figure out. When you poll people who are indigenous Americans, 90 some odd percent say, we're not offended by the Washington Redskins name. Well, wait a minute. Then the other 8% are liberals, right? Why is it if they're not offended? Liberals are. And now liberals tell us that the name is disparaging, it is demeaning, and and that we can't use it because, of course, all men are equal, and that includes indigenous tribes. Well, I agree with that. But on the other hand, if they, they don't feel that it's wrong, that might mean that somehow they're not offended by it. So then the liberals come in, and then the liberals say, well, you've got to be offended by it. You, you, you foolish Indians, you, I'm so much smarter than you as an American leftist, you, you don't even know that, well, so it's sort, of, it's sort of the liberals are actually the ones who are disparaging the indigenous tribes because the tribesmen don't have a problem with it, and the liberals say, well, yeah, but we're really smart, and apparently you aren't, so you've got to have a problem with it. Let us instruct you how. You want to talk about an actual reverse, uh, never mind. 40 minutes after 9, 35 at our studios on KLIX. Oh, this is good. This is uh, great music for uh, this uh, time of year because we're going to be very summer-like, especially by the weekend. With a weekend uh, high on uh, Saturday, at least, of 70, if not warmer. 9.44, 9.44, right now at our studios. I'm Bill Colley. This is Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX, com online. It means you can hear us anywhere around the world. I just got one of those notifications in my email that I have a new follower on Twitter. And as usual, I have no idea who this individual is, although he says that he's a writer of crime fiction, true crime books about murder, art theft, forgery, and less uh, elevated wrongdoing. Oh, uh, and financial industry scams. All right. I guess there's a relationship in there somewhere. It happens a lot. You know, on social media, you get requests, and you don't really know who these people are. You try your best to figure out, all right, should I allow this person? Uh, With Twitter, you don't really have much of a choice. But with Facebook, you can say accept or deny. So I have to sort of scratch my head and see if they're mutual friends and see if they're, you know, if they're they're writing me from the dark side or the, uh, the, the bright side and you get through all of that. It's a lot of lot of extra work that we have now in modern media. Talking about social media, the uh, the NSA probably already knew this, but your tweets, if you if you're on Twitter, can reveal your real location. And this comes from a guy named Giuseppe. He's a reporter at the Daily Caller. He apparently doesn't have a last name. Cornell University researchers have developed a method of identifying the physical location of users on Twitter. Even when they have the social media platform's geotagging feature switched off. There's a geotagging feature? I didn't know. All right, well, that's a news to me. By looking at users' followers and those they include on mention or mention in their tweets, 
Cornell researchers said they were able to identify the physical location of 80% of public tweets to just over six kilometers, that would be less than four miles. The assumption is that the majority of Twitter users mentioned fellow users in close proximity during tweeting, and that by tracking the small number of Twitter users with tweet geotagging enabled, researchers can infer where those with the feature turned off are. Okay, now we are giving them the rope to hang ourselves with. Think about that for a moment. You know, we, we, we use, we're so heavily dependent on social media and our uh, smartphones. And I had one of the dumb phones for a while, but because of work, I ended up getting what's called a smartphone because I, it was, well, I'm not going to be able to hide. If it all comes crashing down and Elizabeth Warren decides uh, when she's president to put all of us in uh, relocation camps, I'm not one of those who's going to be able to hide. And I've got a record behind me online and on talk radio. So yes, I've already reached that conclusion. She'll have me chopping rocks at some camp in New Mexico uh, by the early part of uh, 2017. Meanwhile, the rest of you, though, if you're using a smartphone or you're using Twitter, you leave a record wherever you are. Think about that for a moment. There was a fellow in Germany who decided to do a freedom of information request. He'd been on a train riding across the country, not a huge country, but he discovered that on about 600 occasions, his phone got pinged with all of the different cellular measurements, you know, as he's going cross country. About 600, and so there was an actual record of him, which showed where, well, because it showed where his phone was. Maybe he puts his phone on the train and sends it off to Dusseldorf on its own. Ah, when you're furnished with your vacation, please come back. No, it doesn't happen like that. So when you're on your cell phone, you are leaving a record. If you're driving down the highway, let's say you decide to take Route 80 and you head east toward Ohio, and that phone, that smartphone is on, as you're driving down the highway, ping, 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 plus you stop and you buy gasoline, you whip out your debit card, ping, you go to a hotel and spend the night, ping, so you've, you've gotten, and then you go to a restaurant, you put that debit card down again, ping. You, you've just told everyone exactly where you've been and where you are. And now with Twitter, we know that they can track pretty much where you are just by reading your tweets, that there are giveaways in your tweets. Friends, if the whole thing comes crashing down and they come for us, we have to blame ourselves now, don't we? When you think about that, they've given us the tools to do it. And we're also enamored with all of these tools. A few weeks ago, I left this phone at home. Now, before I ever had a cell phone in 2006, I would have never given this any thought. But I got to work, and I walked into work, and I was sitting at my desk and realized I didn't have my cell phone. Not that I needed it, because I have a computer in front of me, can read email, do all of those things, and I have an old-fashioned landline here at the office. But when you don't have that cell phone, you know, you suddenly the rest of the day, you know, you're fidgety, and you're worried, and you're concerned, and, and there you go. You, you feel like you've got to have it. But we've given them the rope to hang ourselves with when you ultimately look at it that way. And again, if they figured it out at Cornell University, the National Security Agency has known for a long, 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 long time. What is it they have that thing called Echelon that operates up in the sky, and they've been tracking your movements. And the president, by the way, had said about a year ago that he was going to eliminate a lot of this domestic spying. Story in the Washington Examiner yesterday said, but he hasn't. He got a lot of applause. Yeah, it's wonderful, Mr. President. Uh, we liberals are on board with you. Sure thing. <laughs> and then, of course, after he, got his, he gave it his lip service, he immediately forgot about it and went back to spying on you. Mike Huckabee coming up in just a few seconds with the Huckabee Report, brought to you exclusively by the financial advisors at Waddell & Reed in Twin Falls. The telephone number is 736-6563. Again, Mike Huckabee, straight ahead. Right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. I have a number of things right off the top I'm going to tell you about that, uh, that we're doing today. 